thank you for joining us today, all of you, this huge crowd that we have with us um, for this first session uh, of our Beat a Situationist workshop, uh, where this session is hosted by Pro Arts in Oakland. Uh, I'm part of the team behind Walk, Listen, Create, which curates the yearly Sound Walk September, which is a kind of celebration of sound walks. Uh, and uh, a sound walk, uh, as some of you, some of you in this huge audience uh, might have heard earlier, is uh, typically in its simplest form a walk where, in one way or the other, listening is an integral part of the experience. Now, um, this year, part of Soundwalk September, which is in its fourth installment, if I am not mistaken, and if I am, then it's in its third installment, but I think it's the fourth. No, it's the fourth. Um, part of Soundwalk September is um, uh, Soundwalk City. Uh, now, Soundwalk September is a virtual festival. It happens uh, wherever you are, essentially. But Soundwalk City is an actualization on the ground with uh, specifically a focus on Ljubljana, where Zona, uh, which is a collective of uh, sound artists, a small collective of sound artists, has taken the lead. They've taken the lead in organizing a series of events on the ground, which physically take place in the capital of Slovenia. And part of Soundwalk City is this very workshop, Beat a Situationist, in which Pro Arts is participating. And um, we would have much larger crowds here at this gathering if um, the time difference between uh, Europe, Central Europe, and Oakland would not be uh, uh, impressive nine hours. So it's uh, that alone has been uh, has made it a bit of a challenge to put everything together, but we're here. Um, and this workshop, is, this very workshop, is a combination of two types of events. Um, here in Oakland, uh, you've already physically explored the city last Tuesday, and tomorrow at a more convenient time for Central Europeans, there's a similar event uh, planned with a focus on Ljubljana, but anyone, anywhere, because it's also online, can participate. Uh, and then there is a series of talks. We have four tomorrow, and we have one today. Uh, and all of these talks, in one way or the other, talk about the use and abuse of public space. Uh, now, tomorrow we've got four talks. The first one will be by London-based John Wilde, who will talk about psychogeographic walking practices and how they can be modified to research the digital city. It's followed by a talk by Anja Podreka from Slovenia, and she will review the role of the river in the city and the extent to which nature is controlled in the urban environment. Then we'll have a talk by Cecilia Quiles, who is of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and she will discuss the heritage, uh, the rich heritage of Argentine urban art and the visual language of protest and resistance. And the last speaker tomorrow will be Michael Quitt from the American East Coast, and he will talk about how society is changing due to the introduction of tools that ostensibly make our cities more safe and smart, and that is with quotes. Uh, because it uh, definitely doesn't make them safer and smarter for everyone. Um, and Michael Quet is a bit of a specialist on digital colonialism. Uh, but first today we have uh, with us uh, Natalia Ivanova Mount and Chris Burns, who will have a discussion on how intellectual property rights can be used against their intended purpose and uh, how we can take the initiative away from those who are historically and conventionally in a position to abuse their access to IP. Now, Natalia has a history uh, of operating on a plane where art, technology, and civic engagement meet, and currently she runs Pro Arts in Oakland, and Chris has been working as a lawyer and advisor in IP markets for the last 10 years with a more recent focus on morals clauses and IP licensing. That's it for me for now. The floor, Natalia and Chris, is yours. Thank you so much for this amazing introduction. Um, and thank you so much to everyone in the room who are excited about learning how to turn the IP on its head. Um, very situation is that. Um, thank you to my co-presenter uh, co and collaborator Chris. I'll let him introduce himself uh, uh, briefly as well, um, and then we'll just go into our presentation. We hope that you enjoy it. 
Chris, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you uh, for, for having me join, join today. I'm really excited to, to be here as well. Um, you, one thing I, I, I like to, or a, a way to characterize the importance of intellectual property, and, and I think some of the ways that we're trying to approach it um, that might be new uh, in, in, in how one sort of thinks about intellectual property and its role in public space and in a situationist sort of framework is to really bring in the modern physics framework thanks to Albert Einstein and others um, who have uh, now in, in some ways sort of proven that space and time are one and the same. And intellectual property is actually largely about um, discourse around public and private time. Um, it's a made up, you know, imaginary form of property, uh, but all it really is, is a right to exclude people, others from doing different things for some certain amount of time. Um, and that is ultimately a public right. Uh, so we move from private time into public time when we start to talk about intellectual property, but we'll get into some of the more interesting pieces around how we can, um, uh, occupy our intellectual property and, and hopefully some innovative ways um, and in particular sort of occupy the uh, the license, the intellectual property license that is connected to certain forms of intellectual property. Uh, but as, as Babak and as Natalia had mentioned, I am an intellectual property lawyer. Um, I've been uh, well, uh, I guess uh, maybe I'd like to say I'm a human being who sometimes uh, works in intellectual property. At least that's that's been kind of the case for the past decade or so. Uh, my path into law um, did not, uh, well, I, I had spent a while doing, uh, working with different uh, communities of spiritual practitioners who are interested in liberation theologies before making my way to law school and, and had spent a while in India and in Pakistan and, and some time in the Middle East, and I'm not from Spain. Um, and I mostly kind of split my time between Spain and, and California, where I've been most recently. But um, really interested in, in ways in which um, in which intellectual property has been a, a one of the sort of cutting edge swords of, of neocolonialism um, inside, you know, largely a, a U.S. imperial. <laughs> project. Um, but along with that, there, there, there are, um, you know, there, there is sort of an Achilles heel to be had where one can begin to exclude the excluders um, and exclude the, the behavior that we want to see sort of stop inside certain colonial practice. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit today as we talk about um, intellectual property more generally. Um, so um, yeah, I guess without without further ado, I'll uh, hand it back to Natalia. Okay, so I will start with foregrounding a little bit what priorities, you know, who um, what we're doing with Chris really in terms of um, of um, uh, working on the intellectual property um, um, or occupy IP. Right, he calls it, um, in terms of our project, which is called Performing Prods Company. So I'm going to start by introducing Prods and a little bit the relationship that um, I believe what I've been doing for the past several years has been, um, has had with the situations. And in, in those terms, also the relationship I have with Babak and the Derrida. So ProArt is one of the oldest independent art space in the Bay Area. Uh, embedded in the community since 1974, ProArt has supported more than 20,000 artists and cultural workers over the years and claims a soft spot in the hearts of Oaklanders. Over the past six years that I have worked at the helm of the organization, I have been experimenting with models and modes of its operation with the mission to reestablish it is as an it, Reestablish it as a node in the heart of a more liberatory horizontal cultural commons, one whose operation reframes the value of art and art labor in the context of a different kind of sharing economy. 
I have been deeply involved with the situationist work now for some time, be it critical text, print, film, psychogeography, and or games. Um, in 2017, I co-curated with my colleague Sarah Locker the first survey of cross situ work in the Bay Area of San Francisco, covering the period between 1980 and 2017. This is, in fact, how we met with Babak and why we may see, why you may see, no, why you may see in the Oakland deck in the Derif app, um, a deck called The New Situations, which was the name of the exhibition in 2017. And again, um, it was interesting to me to revisit the app this time and still find the new situation is back there and be able to access it. Um, as part of this exhibition, we curated over 60 events and public interventions in the civic space of Oscar Grand Plaza, which is a, um, the seat of the city government of Oakland and also a site for civic unrest, protest and Occupy Oakland. The Derif app was one such project that existed as a contemporary representation of the situ ideas in terms of psych psychogeography, urban planning and architecture. In 2018, I co-organized a festival entitled the Festival of Post-Capitalism, which lasted for two weeks and consisted of talks, community gatherings, performances and public interventions. Um, for the past several years, I've been organizing, advocating, hustling, mainly hustling, artists and cultural workers that, yes, a different model for working together in the arts is possible. I've been met with both enthusiasm and distrust, but I persist in questioning the hierarchies and power systems in the arts through transgressing ideas and often referring to my practice as a performance of space and place, and more specifically, creating heterotopic spaces that both mirror and counter cultural formations in the arts that we are in intentionally building today. In other words, my involvement with the situation is, one may say, has a direct link to the idea of the transgressive space and questions related to inside, outside, and public-private space dynamics. In other words, how do we occupy space through transgressions, especially public space? How do we occupy a city? If we have commodified public space to the extent that one needs a permit to play loud music at the plaza, then what of using corporate and power system ta tactics and turning them against its intended purpose and against the very oppressors that invented them in the first place? This is how Performing Prods Commons was born. Performing Prods Commons is an experiment in intellectual property and law in which we ask artists and cultural workers to occupy intellectual property by co-creating performances and public interventions in the public space. They're political and transgressive in nature, yet protected under the umbrella of the Performing Prods Commons Transmedia Performance Copyright License. Perhaps a little bit more background, he is needed to contextualize the idea of performing towards commons. <clears throat> and I know Chris, was, Chris will, will take you much, much further into the idea, especially related to the intellectual property. Um, but I wanted to kind of like describe some of those relationships for the viewers today so we can, and some of those connections so we can have a very interesting conversation that is really related on all, and that kind of like relates to all kinds of topics that, that, that that um, the, the um, conference is about. Only a year before the pandemic, Chris Burns and Julia Sozo arrived in Oakland as residents of the newly established Common Knowledge Platform Residency. I launched the ProArts earlier that year. Um, Chris is interested in the Commons, uh, um, sorry. I suggested that Chris should read my essay, Reframing the Value of Art and Fair Labor in the Context of a Sharing Economy, in the hopes to connect our experiences and define the best approach on collaborative work with ProArts that expands the imaginaries of the commons. I shared a Google document with him my essay, and he annotated my paragraphs by relating them to his idea of using intellectual property as a weapon against the systematic racism, narcissism, and financial crimes of the culture machine. This work became the premise of the Performing Products Commons copyright license, and has further extended in various forms of collaboration that I will let Chris again address through his introduction of the morals clause statement and the communion. You can already guess that our collaborative work has both a very narrow has has both a very narrow focus, yet very wide base. As we are working with artists and makers and um, I suppose cultural organizers to transgress the boundaries between art and everyday life. Here we go. The situation is again revolution and protest. 
The invitation to participate in this amazing conference provides a platform for us to consider connecting with more prostitute artists, cultural workers and the public, creating awareness and politicizing otherwise difficult to access legal tools, i.e. intellectual property and patent. If we really intend to rewire the broken circuit between artists and artists, artists and public, and the artists and the institutions, we need to occupy space in a different way, either that be public or private. How do we sustain what we do as artists and cultural workers, despite the capitalist structure that operates on the basis of scarcity and competition? We say we need to transgress. Um, and I believe this is the perfect time to turn to Chris so he can illuminate further ideas related to occupying IP, what is the morals clause statement, and um, he will do so by um, presenting his ideas on the activist art machine. So here we go, Chris, back to you. Great, thank you. For showing the front website, was reading. <laughs> thank you. All right. Can you please start loading? Uh, right. You see on my hydrographic sort of machine now? Yeah, I'm seeing your presentation. How to build your own activist okay, art machine. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right, well, um, so in this in this next piece here, I'm going to walk through a, a kind of guide that will enable um, everyone here to, to learn how to sort of occupy your own intellectual property and, and to use some pretty convenient um, legal licensing tools that have been made available both from um, Creative Commons which some of you may be familiar with and, and which I'll, I'll share a little background on in, in a second, um, plus an additional layer of, of uh, copyright licensing that is specifically dedicated to, um, to sort of speaking to commercial use of intellectual property. Um, and the reason why we want to speak specifically to commercial use is because that is sort of the canvas um, upon which we, we want to make our art and, and to sort of speak to the politics of the market. Uh, and um, we, we can use Creative Commons as, as a background using their non-commercial use licensing and then combine the Creative Commons license with some custom-made commercial use restrictions in order to really empower ourselves as artists, um, as creators of copyright, um, and as ultimately, um, you know, perhaps uh, situationists ourselves. Um, so you can see uh, here at the bottom of this, we'll get to, to um, these in, in some more detail, but the bottom left corner shows some, some markings that, you know, in, in, um, in to many people are, are really just legalese and, and things that we might not really know what they mean, but these actually carry an enormous amount of legal weight all over the world. Um, the Creative Commons licenses are intended to be used internationally. Creative Commons is both a nonprofit organization and I think, as they describe themselves, a, a kind of social movement that began around 20 years ago um, really as, as a means to respond to the internet and to the promise of the internet to sort of become a space for sharing um, and a space where, where cultural exchange and um, knowledge production and access to knowledge and, and knowledge exchange was something that um, had essentially uh, come to, to have a, a near zero cost for, for sharing, whereas prior to the internet, we'd have to be um, making photocopies of, of books, uh, you know, using a mail system in order to send texts. And now all of a sudden, just through the click, um, through a website to, um, to any domain anywhere around the world, all of a sudden we could access uh, just an incredible amount of knowledge 
at our fingertips um, for for near nothing. Um, despite the promise of of um, of all of this, and, and of course all of the successes and, and things we've all experienced with uh, sort of the, the proliferation of of an internet, um, copyright law uh, began its its sort of intermediating into trying to stop uh, what you know th this this sort of free flow of information and exchange. Um, copyright being ultimately concerned with um, establishing very strong rights to exclude um, that would prevent, um, in, in its best case, you know, a, a type of piracy or, or a, a, a taking of information without compensation for artists, for creators who had put in oftentimes an enormous amount of labor into their productions and, and perhaps at its, at its worst case, a means to simply stifle access to information and knowledge, um, oftentimes as a means for, for some type of further social control or, or for marketing or, or for whatever purposes we may have. Um, what I'm going to walk through here is um, first, you know, what is um, an activist art machine is an imaginary tool, um, it's something that, that I just made up that we can each use in our own art practice to add another dimension to the politics of our art. Um, it's an imaginary machine that sits right at the membrane between the imaginary and economic reality. Um, art goes in. Um, here in, in this picture, you're seeing a, a Disney animation that has been um, and perhaps we could say graffitied onto Salvador Dali's um, painting Persistence of Memory. Um, I can get into uh, why I chose this picture at another time, um, but um, the, the short of it is that the really the, the reason we have the copyright law um, that now sort of exists in, in uh, around the globe in, in, or around much of the globe is largely thanks to the Disney uh, company and its very aggressive lobbying effort. Um, in short, though, art goes into our activist art machine. And uh, in, in here, you draft a, perhaps a manifesto or a morals clause, which is something that we'll, uh, I'll, I'll describe in a bit more detail here in a moment as well. And then what comes out is with some of these markings that all of a sudden make the art cast a new energy in the economy. Um, as you look over to the ones you've just seen on, on the screen, this is again uh, a creative comments on the creative comments plus your barcode. Um, a barcode means something that would link one back to a manifesto or a morals clause that would govern the commercial use in terms that be used with um, with the art. Um, the sort of this, what I think about all of this as as sort of thinking thinking about art energy um, that sort of invisibly adheres to the artwork. Is that that's that's how the law um, will will treat um, any type of copyright that is stuck onto any type of creative work. Um, uh, uh, well, just... So what I'm going to walk through this presentation is a three-step method to build your own activist art machine. And um, you can then take apply these techniques um, to use on, on any work of art. The first step, um, I'll preview these quickly so you know where we're going. The first step is going to be engaging your artwork with, with a kind of anarchic perspective, something where you're inherently suspicious of copyright and of the types of exclusivity that the state automatically imposes upon your art, whether you want it to or not. Um, the second step, um, once we've kind of engaged this perspective and, and have thought critically about what is happening to our art, 
Um, we're going to talk about how you calibrate the economic artistic energy that accompanies intellectual property. We're going to teach you how to tinker with this kind of economic radiation um, that your intellectual property gets, so that you pull its energy and sort of make your own art with it. The third, we're going to talk about how you can apply the to your own work. We'll quickly walk through what you do physically apply to work so that's a path um, that you So first, um, what do we mean, what do I mean when I say engage your art with an anarchic perspective? Um, this is the student. What type of space can I, can I interrupt you for uh, one second? Sorry. I don't know sure, how, how sure. Uh, it is for others, but the, the line breaks up for me regularly. And I've uh, sometimes I've got a hard time hearing what you are saying. Uh, and by the sound of it, it's maybe because you're trying to run too many things on your computer. <laughs> that, that could well be. Yeah, let, me, let me close the computer. Okay. And if it continues, then please stop me. I can switch my Wi-Fi connection to another um, another that I have here. Okay. Let's see. So the the first we have here is what type of state-sanctioned power adheres your art, and how do you want to occupy or inhabit that power? Um, but um, as uh, uh, there are many different types of intellectual property um, that exist, there are trademarks, copyright, patents, trade secrets. Um, but when we're talking about artwork um, and visual art or sound art or or sort of things in in the realm of of fine art, we're talking about copyright as the operable intellectual property. What is copyright? Copyright is simply a right to exclude others from using, sharing, or selling um, a, a art. Um, copyright law protects, quote unquote, original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium. These are very legalistic terms um, that uh, have, you know, uh, uh, now legal sort of particular legal definitions that are actually very open uh, talk about these in, in a moment but what you can really imagine with copyright is that it's like shrink wrap that the state puts on everything the minute you create something new the minute you sketch with your pencil in a sketchbook without having to register that picture without having to do anything Copyright law immediately protects your sketching, and what it really does is kind of shrink wraps your sketch with an invisible um, right to exclude that prohibits anyone else on the planet or, or anywhere that has these copyright laws, which, which again is uh, the vast majority of countries now around the world, um, from being able to copy um, and use your sketch. Um, so, what is the standard, though, for originality? Um, you know, if, if we just, I'm a terrible art, uh, visual artist myself, so am I, you know, is, is, are my drawings so bad that they can't be afforded copyright protection? The answer to that is no. Um, the threshold for what it takes to get copyright protection is so low, um, the only thing we know that hasn't reached copyright protection was alphabetizing a phone book. That was deemed to not be creative enough, but by and large, um, anything that shows any sort of sentient um, or, or sentience of, of human consciousness in some form is going to automatically have copyright law um, apply. Um, other, other laws, but that stands for Visual Arts Rights Act, um, you can feel free to follow up with me later if, if you want to talk about some of these other 
types of intellectual property rights that are afforded um, to people, the visual artists, rights that exist in the United States. Um, those in Europe um, will have a different set of, of laws that exist um, through moral rights themselves that are baked into um, intellectual property law in, in Europe that do not exist in the U.S. And those moral rights are also going to be different from the morals clauses that we're going to be talking about here today. Um, but perhaps it's no surprise that um, in the United States, the United States government decided to do away with any type of inherent moral rights for artists and instead um, requires artists or, or any creator to just go straight to a, a kind of freedom of contract where you have to write your morality affirmatively and explicitly if you ever want the state to, to protect it. Um, Generally speaking, you know, we want to think about the sort of meets and bounds of, of copyright law and how it applies to your art. Um, there are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of questions that we'll get into around, can you copyright a sound? You know, can you copyright something? Um, as I mentioned, copyright has to exist in a, a fixed medium in order for it to be copyrightable. Um, and what does that mean? That typically can just mean any type of sound recording um, or a photograph or something that exists in space um, over time. Uh, if you are simply doing a live improvised performance and no one is there to copy it or to sort of record it in any way, then copyright will not apply. Um, but if you are filming it at the same time that you're performing it, for instance, then copyright can apply which is how you get copyright protection over things that are happening in real time that are only mildly scripted, things like reality TV um, or perhaps a documentary or something like that. Um, okay, um, a quick, a quick uh, reflection on the images that I have here. Uh, I, I think it is helpful when we try and zoom out and really think about what's happening with our anarchic squint, you know, what's happening to our art. I try and go all the way out to imagining myself as a satellite that's in orbit around the Earth, and that's because we can go that far away, and copyright law is actually still going to exist, um, and it's, in fact, from that type of perspective where we see the full weight of state authority and, and the power of copyright in its greatest form. Um, and underneath here, uh, at the bottom, there's a blurry ring. This is an image of a black hole um, uh, that was in 2019. Um, black holes, I think, are actually a, a useful way to, to kind of imagine what can happen if we engage in collective action with our copyright. Um, much like gravity, which, as you know, um, everything with mass has a little bit of a gravitational pull, but it's so weak that we never really feel it between one another. Um, but if we combine our mass into one giant, giant sort of coordinated uh, piece of matter, like the Earth, um, like the sun, like anything else, all of a sudden the power of gravity um, really comes to shine all the way until we get something as powerful as a black hole. Um, copyright works in the same way. The copyright protection over the doodle on, on in your notebook, the doodle on a napkin, may not be powerful in its own right. But if we combine each of our, uh, the power we have of each of our individual little copyrighted works and the copyright that we're making on a day-to-day -day basis, and we govern it all with a standardized sort of morals clause terms, all of a sudden we can have a bunch of coordinated power that may allow us to actually do some, some interesting and innovative things as a club. So um, the next piece of what we do in our activist art machine, we now understand with our anarchic sort of critical squint of what is happening when we create, 
We know copyright law is coming and is sticking and is applying whether we want it to or not. Um, and so what happens is because copyright defaults everything to be all rights reserved, all, all exclusion immediately as, as strong as it can be, um, we actually have to do something with that exclusive energy that has attached to our art if we want to um, if we want to sort of break down the walls of exclusion that divide us, if we want to actually use our intellectual property as a means for interrelating, for, for breaking walls and for creating inclusion rather than the exclusion, we need to calibrate the artistic energy of our intellectual property. Um, so what we have here, Again, sort of using this idea as as light energy um, as a, as a means to understand our copyright energy. This little spectrum here um, goes from the lowest amount of exclusion, which is a, a, a complete disavowal of copyright altogether, an affirmative dedication of our art into the what is called the public domain. That's the red. Red is the lowest energy when we talk about light energy. Um, and then on the blue side, um, violet is the highest amount of exclusion. This is the all rights reserved. This is what applies automatically even if we don't do anything. But oftentimes, if we want to signal our intention to really own and occupy um, our exclusion, we may put this with the circle around it. Um, these are by courts. So these are tools that you can use in your own artwork and actually sort of save yourself a bunch of money not having to go speak to a, a copyright lawyer. Um, you can just begin to use these symbols yourself and they, they work just fine. Um, first, I'll talk a little bit about the public domain. And what the public domain is really all about, um, most of us from a, a kind of critical perspective, those who find copyright and, and perhaps the mere existence of intellectual property to be absurd in its own right are, are quick to want to disavow intellectual property altogether. And we're often very keen to say we want a robust public domain. We want a public domain, which is essentially a space where our knowledge can live without exclusivity, um, a space where our knowledge can be used freely and no one can come and try and step in um, to say that, no, uh, this is copyright protected and you're not allowed to use this knowledge for whatever reason. Um, some helpful information about the public domain. I'm going to speak um, specifically to some US law. Um, these, these laws can vary by country. Uh, but these are generally uh, laws that are, are harmonized through trade agreements, things like the World Trade Organization, for some harmonization of these terms. Um, and the Berne Convention is another copyright treaty that, that governs many of these terms. But the way it works is you've sketched in your notepad the little pencil drawings, all of a sudden the shrink wrap of copyright exclusivity comes and sticks to it. And now that shrink wrap is going to sit there and it's not going to sort of fall off um, until you as the author are dead and 70 years have passed. So all copyrighted works will eventually enter the public domain, much to Disney's chagrin, um, but it takes a long time. And the length of copyright has been growing and growing and growing over time. A century ago, um, it was, uh, I think, 25 years. It wasn't even the life of an author. We now have our copyright, our, co our intellectual property estate, and our, and, and our exclusivity that we control as creators will now surpass our own life. Um, and it, again, uh, becomes something that we need to take control of if we don't want this exclusivity to sort of stick onto our art. If someone has hired you, if an art gallery has hired you to do a work, then the copyright might only last 95 
years, um, still well, well past the lifetime. So what Creative Commons had, had done, seen that a lot of people want to reject copyright altogether, is create what was called Creative Commons Zero um, uh, license. And to use this, you can simply put a C with a circle around it and a cross through it. But that's it waves and abandons copyright where it exists. It also includes an affirmative license allowing unconditional use for others. And it also includes an affirmative, what is called a covenant not to assert the copyright. So there's a lot of legal activity going on underneath this C with the cross through it. Um, because also maybe don't want to use that because there's a lot more we can do if we hold on to some of our right to exclude, to again exclude the excluders and to stop some bad behavior. So you put it in the public domain, um, anyone can use it, even your worst enemy, and people using it in ways you may not like. Um, generally, there are um, four elements of a Creative Commons license. Um, the first is the attribution. This, some of these symbols are a bit antiquated and uh, patriarchal in, 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 the, in their different I think that um, no one can mess with these however they want. You can always just use by, um, by to, to get attribution. Uh, or I think these are going to be updated by Creative Commons soon to, to my gender. But um, this simply requires one to identify the author. This says, if I'm the artist and someone uses my art, I want you to give me credit as the artist. Another, this ends, each has a dollar sign through it or a euro sign through it or whatever currency you may want to use. You can put a circle around it and an X through it. This means that you're allowed to use this work in any way you want, but not for commercial purposes. Um, it's important to note that even if you're a nonprofit, even if you're out there trying to do well as an organization, that does not give you a, a free right to use um, to use work uh, for fundraising purposes. Um, so if if you are using any type of work promotionally or for for some fundraising purpose, even if you're a nonprofit, um, you have to still get a commercial use permission. Um, this next is share alike, which has this backwards like sign. What that means is that anyone who takes the art that you've made has to propagate the same license terms that you put onto the art, even if they make maybe some minor modifications. If it's considered a derivative work or something that is um, deeply inspired in a way that could have only sort of come from the original work then they have to still carry forward your license terms. This can be a helpful way to make your license terms go viral, including those of a morals clause, which we'll get to. And there's a note that is the equal sign. This means that you're not allowed to even remix or make an adaptation of the original work at all. Um, We've got a lot of these, again, exclusivity that comes from these. Um, a no derivatives is a very strong form. It doesn't allow people to tinker mix, which is that is then used too often. But by and large, what we're going to use when we talk about really getting transgressive with RIP is this attribution, non-commercial, and share alike terms from the Creative Commons license and then we're going to add a commercial term. And so what that means is that we're allowing people to use our artwork non-commercially however they want. We're saying that if they do use it, they have to give you credit as an artist. And we're also saying that if they do anything with this artwork, um, make any derivatives or anything else to it, and want to license their own additions to it, they're going to have to carry your license terms forward. Um, including the commercial use terms. Um, here, just as a, a reference, these are different symbols you can use on your artwork. Um, you can just write CC by CC by. You can actually write it out. 
if he's placed or he's symbols on the right side, I think he's here as a point of reference, um, and you can find these online as well, but I won't spend too much time on these. But this covers a whole universe of pre-com slices aside from, you know, addition to that pre-com zero, which is the dedication. Wait, Chris, 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 we can you again. Yeah. So sorry. Okay, let me, um, yeah. Let me try something, one sec. This is better now. I don't know, every time you start talking fast, it, 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 it's so weird. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling you're switching back and forth between applications, which is uh, what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I'm, 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 I'm not touching. That. Unfortunately, I think it's, it's just probably a weak signal that I'm getting down here. I think it's probably just my... <laughs> My poor internet. Let me let me try and switch over one sec. But now, now it was great. Now it's great as well. I don't know. What's up now we've lost him because he's going to another connection. Yeah. Nope. I guess we should have. Okay. Okay. Am I am I back here? Can you, can you hear me? Now you're back. Yeah. Yeah. Back. yeah. Okay. Let's see. Seems to be better now. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Everything good. Yeah. Great. Okay. Start at so the, the one... slide with all the different uh, Creative Commons licenses. Oh, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Okay. So here, um, please feel free to refer this. As a reference, of um, creative licenses that are available um, is the fourth one down. The attribution. Okay, no, sure. Stop, stop, stop. No, no, it's, it's not working. Uh, you really mumbled. Um, God, what can I show the goddamn thing and then you just talk? No. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you can. Baba, can you can you um, do that since I was not able to share my screen? But maybe that's the, the difference because now I can hear you great. Talk a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, this is much better. I don't know what's up with the. It's, it's probably the, the bandwidth pull yeah. from doing the screen share. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, Babak doesn't have access, unless you can send him the link, Natalia, to, I have the link in the Word document um, that would give him access. Yep. Um, but I will continue, um, it's okay to, to work through this, and, and I, I thank, I thank our, our audience for being patient as we get through some of this legal stuff. Um, the short of this is that there are exceptions and limitations to copyright as well. One can always make fair use copies. These are absolute rights that you get. Um, but that is pretty probably important as we get towards adding elements of these licenses or manifestos and, and morals. Um, what we do is, if, if you refer back to the slide that I did have, both the third and the fourth um, uh, ways down had uh, attribution to non-commercial use. Was the third, the fourth was attribution non-commercial and share alike. Right. I'm on slide nine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and so what you can do to begin is uh, to sort of lay the groundwork for, for beginning to, to um, get ready to, to kind of pop in what will start to get more interesting here in a second, is to use either, I would recommend either of these licenses. Um, I use the share alike because I want my morals clause travel with my art. 
um, whenever whenever we do it. Um, so we'll get to how you can also then talk about these manifestos and, and morals in a, in a second. But we can actually go to the next slide. So um, what is a morals clause? Okay, this is where things uh, become a little a little more innovative. Uh, a morals clause is simply a, a, a part of a contract. It is a, a contract term that sits inside of an intellectual property license. License is just another fancy word for a contract. And there are some innovative um, legal uh, sort of tricks that um, myself and a few others have created to allow us to, to create morals clauses that don't require a lawyer to, to have drafted them with all of this useful legalese. And what they are, though, is, is a morals clause essentially says one cannot use my artwork um, in a way that violates my morals or you know my manifesto the the reason it's called a morals clause which i know can be an alienating term to those who aren't so interested in um american lawyers moralizing or really anyone for that matter moralizing is simply uh it, it's a term of art inside the law it's just a way to describe the contract clause we could call it a manifesto clause as well um where we see morals clause morals clauses exist as an example is so far they typically only occur inside agreements between corporations and celebrities so when Gillette razor which is a, a shaving razor company decides that tiger woods the famous u.s golfer um has uh, you know, got into a car accident um, from drunk driving, and Gillette says, we don't want to be associated anymore with Tiger Woods, despite the fact that Tiger Woods has made us so much money along the way, and we're Gillette, perhaps we're mining the tin that goes into our razors with child labor um, in, in, you know, in, Southeast Asia or, or, in, or in parts of Africa, um, forget all of that. Our morals are attached to our brand and we, don't, we no longer want to be affiliated with Tiger Woods. So we're going to invoke a morals clause that we have in our sponsorship agreement with, with Tiger Woods and we're going to cut the contract. Tiger Woods is no longer going to get paid. We'll have extracted the goodwill that we have, but now we can move on and try and protect our goodwill. Don't look behind the curtain, though. Don't ask about the morality of our supply chains. Um, those typically aren't in play, although what we intend to do with our morals clauses and our critical engagement with um, the global economy is to turn that on its head, is to write a morals clause where we as artists push back against large corporations, against exploitative art galleries, um, against the structures that hold power that have often been oppressive towards us. We can use morals clauses against police, against surveillance, um, against, in particular, the, the private prison industrial complex. Um, these are all things where if we espouse some type of morality um, or some terms, some manifesto, that governs how our art can be commercially used. And when we begin to think creatively about our art as perhaps protest performance that we know is going to be filmed by private surveillance companies who are going to sell that video footage to the police in order to have them try and figure out who they want to arrest and add into the prison industrial complex we may be able to then use a morals clause against those actors, turning the tables on itself. Um, how we do this without having to have everyone write, have a lawyer convert our manifestos into legalese, 
is we just attach what is called a duty of care. This is a legal idea that exists, again, around the world. Um, and a duty of care is simply something that we all take on all the time. When we invite neighbors over to our house, the reason we have to, uh, if you're renting, sometimes a renter will make you have homeowner's insurance or something like that. Because if someone falls on your property and it's slippery, in the United States at least, far too many people know you can get sued for just about anything. And what you're oftentimes getting sued for is negligence. You haven't upheld a duty of care that you owe to another person. If we take this idea of a duty of care, this duty we have to sort of respect and, and give honor to some, some articulated principle, we can get around. Um, this is an experimental legal license, so these haven't been tested in court, but the legal logic should hold. We can take this duty of care and then we add in our manifesto and then our manifesto can be poetic. Our manifesto can be a true expression of the heart um, and what we are doing is requiring anyone who's going to take some commercial use of our art to, to practice some care towards this manifesto, which at the very least means they have to try to understand it, they have to try and interpret it inside the manifestos and morals clauses we may in our own language describe what we want to happen and what people need to do and some of those can be in clear terms perhaps as natalia has done with some of her morals clauses you may require someone who wants to use natalia's art to first write natalia a love letter um, and that's a beautiful way if if if, if someone takes natalia's art and doesn't write her a love letter and then uses it in, in some way that she doesn't like, she can then essentially tell them they have to stop or she can sue them for copyright infringement. Um, she has this, this legal authority and this power that she can now bring back to these people and to say, why didn't you write me a love letter? She can, she can engage her art and the way her art interfaces with the economy on her terms not on the terms of the state, not on the terms of Disney and its lobbyists. Um, we can take control of the terms upon which our art enters the economy and we can refine what those terms and what the interaction should be between those consuming our art in the economy and us as producers of our art. Um, there is on this, uh, on, on um, the preceding slide, there's another sample of, of some of these uh, IP license templates. We'll be continuing to build a library of these, I think, through performing Pro Arts Commons as we collect more and more of them and start to have fun with the network of morals clauses that we can begin to pull together. Um, now we can go to, to slide 11. So third, okay, so, so we've done our anarchic squint, we figured out, gosh, this is crazy, the state is imposing this shrink wrap of exclusivity on everything I create, whether I want to or not. Now we've learned how to calibrate our energy, our artistic energy, um, with a combination of Creative Commons licensing and then um, the creation of our own morals clause, manifesto in some form. We'll, we'll show you some more examples of these in a moment um, and can talk about those in greater detail. But the third step then is, okay, now what, how do I apply this license to my art so that it actually, th this kind of new energy, the invisible economic art energy that I've now created and fine-tuned can now sort of radiate itself back out into the economy. This is where we give notice to the world that these are the terms upon which our art intersects with the economy and what we have here is that familiar creative commons license that we described which requires one to give attribution they can use the art for non-commercial purposes and if they make any changes to the art they have to share the whole license with it and then what we did here is just add a logo this is the plus pro arts commons 
simply having these terms, this this license like this, although you know having that Pro Arts Commons thing isn't going to be a full list of all of the legal language. Um, it can be a barcode. It can link back to a website where we've published the manifesto. It can simply be a logo, but the world is now on notice that there is some other term that we can use our own mark, our own graffiti tag, whatever it may be, to embody um, our, our manifesto and our commercial use restrictions that we've created. Um, another way to do this, if you aren't doing visual art um, or if you just want to write it in a different form, is, is you would typically give the title of your artwork, your name as the author, the year that the artwork was made, and then you use this Creative Commons license plus a mark or a QR code. And we can go to the next slide. The reason this is interesting, just, just to further show you what's happening with these marks and why these marks, these kind of legal hieroglyphics are meaningful, is that there's, there's a lot packed into them. There's three layers um, that Creative Commons has made with these legal code, then there's this plain language you can read on Creative Commons website, and then there's machine readable translations. We can skip over this. I just wanted everyone to know that these are really complex, difficult to deal with terms. I know it's even boring to have me continue to talk about them. I promise things will get more interesting, transgressive and radical in a moment, but it's, I think, important that we all understand how much work has gone in by many organizations to try and make this intentionally abstract and difficult to access language something that is accessible. Um, and that alone is kind of its own artwork in, in, in the absurdity of the exclusivity that comes from these types of legal forms. But I, I want to underscore just how hard it is to reduce these powerful legal concepts into these hieroglyphics. Um, we can go to the next slide. And here, um, here again is, is a different way uh, to look at how you might want to do this. The way we do it with performing Pro Arts Commons is, um, is to also say this language on, on top is an effective way to create a, an effective legal notice to the world licensed under Creative Commons, you know, by, this means attribution, NC means non-commercial, SA means share alike, plus the terms defined in Act Pi of performing Pro Arts Commons. This is something you can appreciate if you get a chance to go to the performing Pro Arts Commons website and download a script that um, Natalia, myself, and, and several others have created and actually copyrighted in 2020. Um, this is a, a space where you can begin to participate as a commoner inside uh, performing Pro Arts Commons as well. These are all just examples though. Use them as a reference. You can copy these types of things and, and just add in your own signature or mark or maybe make a barcode to a website where you've posted your manifesto. All of that will work. All of that is, is a valid way to give the world legal notice. Um, we can go to the next slide. Where to put your license notice um, must be visible to the public. Um, so while I mentioned copyright exists whether you register it or not, if you don't write copyright anywhere, the legal assumption is that it is still an um, all rights reserved. However, it's not going to stick so well if you haven't given notice of your intention to occupy the copyright. It can be a just sort of confusing legal matter. So the best thing you want to do is to make your license visible to the public. Um, you want to apply it near a signature or other crediting marks. If you're just doing sound like we're like we're talking about with sound walks, read it into a recording. Um, if it's audiovisual, you're just going to say your name as an author, give a date, give the license terms. It can be words or symbols. 
really effective ways if you're going to be out perhaps doing a walk and people are taking your picture and you want to be performing in protest or in something else and you want your manifesto and the commercial terms that private surveillance may be filming you for and you know that they have a contract with the state and you want to make sure they can't take an image of your copyrighted performance and sell it to the state, maybe put it on your, your mask that you're wearing. Um, you can see that the FBI, um, you know, has tried to use scare tactics in its own language all the time um, for these things, but these are, these are examples of how copyright comes to exist in these ways. Uh, Performing Pro Arts uh, Commons has had some really innovative commoners, including some medics um, who have gone out into, uh, into, into protest spaces and had worn their, um, their manifestos and, and their copyright marks on them so that they as, as medics could be performers and at the very least they could protect anyone filming them, even if it's just an all rights reserved. Um, you still then are saving your space so then you can later refine, calibrate your artistic energy. Maybe you just want to go full max with a C in a circle. That's going to give you maximum protection that you can later whittle away. But for, uh, for deep protests, for, for core political action, the point is to identify and occupy your copyright that you're creating as perhaps a, a live performer. Um, and we can again talk about how to use protest strategies as performance art in a minute here. Um, go to the next slide, please. If all of this just sounds still like too much, um, you, can, you can really just maybe put a circle around a barcode where you're gonna have your license later. Um, who knows if that will work, but if people begin to believe that it will work, then it will work. Um, and that, that is the worst case scenario. You can always put a C with a circle around it plus a QR code or maybe just the circle and the QR code. It's up for grabs, but um, doing either of those are better than nothing. Uh, and, and you can always push to afford more rights. What happens when we get transgressive with intellectual property is we align ourselves with the maximalist corporations who are constantly trying to make copyright be as strong as possible, the Disneys of the world. Um, and so you're not in bad company in that lobbyists who are going to be paying governments in order to strengthen copyright are going to be probably upset at how we've turned the use of copyright now to exclude the exclusion, to be resistant against the political prerogatives of corporations and of capitalists but they're going to have a hard time trying to undermine the way that you use their symbols because they want their symbols to be as strong as possible. And that power, that knowledge gives us a lot of power. Um, we can go to the next slide. And lastly, um, we are working inside a capitalist machine. We are Ardonauts. You know, as we experiment with intellectual property, we are exploring new boundaries and uses. Um, the best way for us to get these things to work, you will hear many lawyers and many others say, this will never work, this can't work. That's because they haven't done it before, but what we need to do is play, you know, break the machine, build it stronger, do it with a friend. Um, legal enforceability is, is as much about a culture and expectation of enforceability as it is around any formalistic uh, type of legal requirement. In the world of copyright law, that's especially true because courts are very confused around the meets and bounds of copyright and they're constantly pushing towards it being stronger. So when in doubt, improvise and play. Um, we can go to slide 18. A couple of frequently asked questions that arise, um, and this will preempt some points we can get into more detail here in a moment in a, in a more dynamic conversation, but it oftentimes arises, can I use my activist art machine to avoid 
being arrested? Can I use my copyright to protect myself from being arrested? No, unfortunately not. Exercising the power of your copyright or other artistic moral rights is not a legal defense for any crime. That being said, if you're committing a crime, there's also no conflict with still being able to create copyright. The systems operate in, in complete, uh, they don't talk to one another at all. Um, but as I mentioned, occupying your intellectual property, using your activist art machine can make it illegal for private companies to sell data or information gathered from recordings of you to the state. Um, and in fact, you can think of instances where we know, as we saw with the FBI warning, copyright law in many countries has become criminal. Um, it's gone so far as to say it can be a felony if copyright infringement is a known problem. This becomes an interesting uh, quagmire for the state because if the state starts to collect evidence that it is attained through private contracts with private surveillance companies, but the private surveillance company was knowingly and criminally recording and taking a copyrighted performance for sale back to the state, then all of a sudden the evidence that the state is trying to collect was gathered from a criminal enterprise. And this creates a, a sort of domino effect of interesting legal defenses inside the criminal justice system. Don't rely on this like it's going to happen, but if you find yourself in trouble, it's worth, and you've been practicing occupying your intellectual property, your copyright, it's worth seeing whether the evidence being used against you by the state was in fact collected illegally, at which point that evidence becomes what's called fruit of a poisonous tree. It's not allowed in a courtroom. It's not allowed to be used against you. Um, another question, do I need to file anything with the copyright office to get my activist art machine to work? No, activist art machines work with copyright. And as we said, copyright applies automatically to your art, even without registering your work with the copyright office. If you ever want to engage in a lawsuit against someone, then you will need to register your copyright um, and you get additional legal benefits by doing so, including an ability to get more money from the people who are misusing and stealing your art or, or abusing or violating your manifesto or your morals clause. Um, what are some examples of the power of using an activist art machine? As I mentioned before, like gravity, if we each have completely different manifestos, we get to, we get to still stand strong and proud inside our own artistic power and in the way our art hits the economy but we function more like little individual units. Like, like gravity, our gravitational pull is gonna be small. But if we join together, and if we begin to use standardized terms, if we all say, no one can use our art if they have child labor in their supply chain, say something like this, then all of a sudden, we start to build this strong defensive force field of art that may find itself in all types of different commercial uses, but it provides a new way and an a increasingly powerful way for us to exclude the exclusive behavior that we don't like. We begin to sort of merge our gravitational potential together, hopefully become something like, um, like this, the strength and power of a black hole. Um, and lastly, it also a, a enables us a way to use adhesion contracts in the same way that every time we have to download a new app and we have to click through terms and conditions, those terms and conditions are what are called adhesion contracts. It forces us as the user to just accept all of the terms that the content owner, that the copyright owner has imposed on us in order to use the product. We can do that back um, to others now if we sort of, practice our activist art machine, use the Creative Commons license plus the commercial use restrictions from our manifestos or morals clauses, 
we have created an adhesion contract and we can begin to shape behavior with our art, um, with that invisible force field of our art. Okay, thank you so much for listening through, I know what is this kind of dry background, but I think with this background, as we now move into a deeper conversation about some of the more fun and experimental forms of transgressive intellectual property, we can really see how this can come to life. Uh, but let me pass it over to Natalia, and thank you all again for uh, for listening. Well, now, now um, we thought that what we can do is connect it back to, of course, the um, the walk that um, myself and um, ten very excited um, pro situationists did with me this past Tuesday um, in Oakland. And uh, Babaki had developed uh, a curated, prompted um, questions for this walk. And uh, I and Chris, myself and Chris, um, included uh, or thought about three specific ones that we can include that are relating to the uh, kind of like the intellectual property conversation. And those were um, similar to like, um, <laughs> <laughs> How can you like copyright the uh, the sound of a particular street, right, or corner on the street? And um, and I just wanted to tell you that the work that I did here in Oakland was very interesting for many for many reasons. One was that it comes. I mean, we all have been um, during the pandemic um, stuck at home, um, just simply walking. Um, today, um, although the barrier is getting better in terms of um, people getting vaccinated and people being a little bit more relaxed to be in the outside space or uh, in the public space, um, everybody was really excited to actually be on the street and occupy the streets of Oakland again. Um, and then in this way, also was interesting that everybody was excited to actually respond in a radical way to occupying the streets today, right? Um, again, you know, there's less people on the streets. There are less traffic on the streets, right? There are a lot of places uh, yet to open, like bars and restaurants. So the city in itself, it's very strange right now. Oakland itself is very strange right now. And so um, it's very interesting to me to have done this work because it became organically very transgressive from the very beginning, because we're even transgressing where we're going, some, some places that we end up going, um, one of the problems of church, for example, right? Um, I mean, we, we couldn't get to a church in downtown Oakland, but also a lot of the churches are still closed. So, um, so further, kind of like, uh, and perhaps I could be more like one, but I, I want to say so many things because the work was really uh, um, a kind of like um, uh, very interesting This the, to, to do these works today, like in, in this kind of like already public environment. The public environment as well, because of the pandemic, um, during the pandemic, the public environment has been um, basically, um, goes down downtown Oakland, right? However, um, more recently, and you know, like not more recently, but maybe six months ago, when when people started to get vaccinated more often, whatnot, um, we in the arts kept getting urged to do all of our events outside. So again, like this is a very, I keep saying interesting, I don't know what I was to say right now, but, um, but it's again, um, what I've been kind of like saying all, all along is like we should be going outside and doing all of events and interventions and walking and singing and talking, whatever, in the in the public space. Because the public space was so so um difficult to navigate due to permits and uh you know if I um were doing the situationist exhibition during the new situation exhibition, those sixty events we did, we permitted each one of them because they were in the public space of the plaza. Now, and even during the pandemic, another interesting thing that happened is that a lot of filmmakers got on the streets because they did not need any more licenses, for example, to shoot on the streets or have a cast in whatever, you know, to have actors and whatever. So in a way, due to the pandemic, public, public space became um, much more um, 
became much more of a, of a thing, I suppose, or people started to experience public space in a different way, right? Um, again, I hear a lot of people now saying, I'm not going in, into a bar or restaurant, I'm only sitting outside, you know. In fact, America has now become very much like Europe and Brazil, where everything is outside, all the cafes and the bars have an outside portion, right? But, um, but still aimlessly walking around, you know, it's not, um, and, I, and again, I think that the, the connection with the pandemic, because we did aimlessly walk around a lot and explored, in a way, the city, um, a dead city in a way, right? Because of the lockdown and everything like that. So, um, so, so the public space has been in a way liberated due to the pandemic, because now we are on the streets all the time, and we occupy the streets all the time in a different way. We, for example, here in America, are very excited. Now you can drink on the streets, you know. In Oakland, you can have a beer on the street now due to, <laughs> due to COVID, right? Before that, you had, you had no legal rights to, to, to drink or whatever on the street, right? Um, and so um, when we did the walk here in Oakland, we were very aware that we actually could be even more transgressive in our walking because in a way there's nobody to see you anymore like that like the the public space has become super occupied in a way and at the same time more liberated and at the same time people just need to be outside and want to be outside so they don't go crazy right and so with that um again like the way we experience public space currently at the moment is super um uh, it is in a way more transgressive already because, again, there's no cops who tell you not to drink on the street. There's nobody telling you, oh, don't climb that building because you're going to get hurt. I mean, who knows if an ambulance comes if you get hurt. But a lot of those services and a lot of kind of like the policing and the curtailing of uh, behavior and sort of like the morals of the streets have changed is what I'm trying to say, you know. So it was really exciting to do the walk again because um when we talked with babak about the participation um in this conference i thought it would be also interesting to to marry what you heard from um that chris talked about um to marry this idea of performing products commons which is sort of like performing or embodying um and uh through performing you embody the idea of occupying time and space through walking also paired let's say with intellectual property right conversation or discourse or kind of like ideation right or protest or revolutionary um um the the, the act of the walk it could be perceived of course as a revolutionary act especially if if the walk is um you know uh, uncurated not curated or sort of like not prompted in terms of doings um so uh, when I did the walk with uh, my, my beautiful comrades here in Oakland, what was really interesting is that I kind of layered the idea of performing the walk, actually performing it, because I wanted to see if we can, again, um, layer some of the, uh, the things that myself and Chris have been working on with performing pros commons with the Derif app and the whole situation is ideation of, of course, psychogeography, which is which is exactly sort of like this uh, uh, radical mapping of a city, right? And um, and I um, and I and I guess I, I want to now bounce it to Chris because we, um, in preparation for this conversation, we talked a lot about how can we actually use the idea of layering as well of, of agendas um, in order to fortify or kind of co-produce and cooperate on co-producing this um, uh, either intellectual property or images or uh, and sound. And so one of the things about layering is that I was questioning in terms of group dynamics, right? We started to respond to the prompts together and immediately you can see um, because we had 10 people and nobody really wanted to separate in smaller groups. Um, we also had one phone which was really great you know and everybody was shouting the prompts uh, that that person who had the phone was shouting the prompts but it became very clear is that we are moving as a mass on the streets right but also that uh, a leader already emerged right as part of this uh, this walk right because of the person who had the phone. So then um, it was interesting to me, and again, I'll bounce it to Chris in a second, 
how do we collaborate even through the Derive app and through experiencing the same things, right? Um, one person took the picture because there's one phone, right? We all kind of navigated and agreed on a little bit, but not too much. Like, um, when, like for, for example, you know, um, one of the prompts was uh, he, um, uh, record or take a picture of a sound that has been around for a thousand years, right? And some people wanted to take a picture of a tree that was at the plaza at that time. And some people wanted to, whatever. Everybody wants to capture or kind of like do their artist kind of like copy, uh, copyright mark, right? In a different way. Um, but eventually, or uh, not eventually, but, but I guess eventually we all release kind of like this copyright idea. It's like my, my, my. It's like, okay, well, the guy who actually had the phone took a picture of a dog. You know, so that's how this idea was represented. But then I thought it's really interesting. What? Uh, so who has the copyright in a way? I know it's Creative Commons. I know that the Riff app is open source and everything's Creative Commons, right? Correct. On a very personal level, right? You know, it just it just made me made me um made me think about how we collectively create versus how we individually collect in uh, um, create, right? And how by walking together and creating together and experiencing the sound walk, right? We did we collectively copy right the did we do that? Is what I'm saying, trying to say? Did we copyright that walk collectively because we we collaborated and co-created this um, these images and these responses and these words and these kind of like sounds, right? Or did we um, did we do a revolutionary thing by even thinking about again, you know, be, being aware of the idea, even the questions of a copyright, right? Who who owns it? And again, how would other people experience what you have created as a result, right? How would how would other people experience this, in a way, copywritten walk, right? Um, and um, in in like in time, time and space, right? Would the copyright hold? Would it be very different? Can you change a copyright? Like things like that, right? Can you, um, and again, um, the, the layering of performance, which is a little bit more political in its intense, right? Closer to a protest with aimlessly wandering around the streets, which is not very aimlessly because we're prompted with questions, but also because, um, as I said before, like now we're kind of like, the, we're experiencing the city in a different way anyway. So I felt this energy from the people participating in the walk anyway, that we are now together experiencing the city in this new way because we haven't been on those streets for a long time. And guess what? We haven't even noticed that this street has a particular smell or sound. And so some of the prompts like, can you copyright, copyright the smell or sound? Uh, can you copyright? Um, can you copyright something that is not tangible? That is that is a form of just like the art. And and again to that end, do we do? Can we copyright our everyday life? Because we do that every day. We walk around. We hear. We see. We take pictures. We take videos. Right. Um, who has this media at the end? Who has access to this media? How do we make sure that, as Chris was talking about, is that we are building this? Um, activist art machines, even if we are in a situation in which we are very traditionally experiencing a city, walking the city, the reefs or whatnot, right? How can we um, even turn this very political act already of radical mapping of a city by the autonomous citizens, right, into can we copyright the city with a morals clause, for example? That was my question to Chris. I was like, I wish we can copyright should we have, like, as a collective of 10 people, can we now write a morals clause statement and then copyright this walk that we did on Tuesday? Or do you, Babak, have to copy, uh, write a morals clause statement about your intentions of how that would be used within the app, right? Who is going to have access and all this stuff, you know? And lastly, it was interesting because actually this time around in 2017, when we did the situation is you know, when we, we worked with you again with the Derif app, I think people were more excited about it. And then, um, although the 10 uh, comrades that came to the walk were very excited and energized and were very young and beautiful humans, right? They were sort of suspicious because they, a couple of them asked me, 
can we do the work without the app? And I said, why? I mean, the whole point is to follow the prompts and do a curated work with the app, right? And they said, well, we don't want to download. Who has? So there was all these questions, you know, who has access to this app? Will people, like, you know, some a couple of kids who are with our group were homeless, you know, so they don't want to necessarily share the information. So it made me think about how really perfect this um, collaboration is between myself and, um, I, and, and you know, all of us here in the room, right? Is because um, maybe we are these days a little bit more aware of how um, state and surveillance works and how digital world works in, 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 in stealing our identities and information and, and copyrights indeed. Our immaterial labor will never be copywritten, right? What we do on Facebook and Instagram and whatever. But, um, but at the same time, could we not use those same techniques and say, well, this work was actually copywritten and if we write the moral school statement and if Babak also is, agrees to write the moral school statement that this work can actually protect some people if they were to do it tomorrow, right? Or other people can take an inspiration and begin participating in this intentional uh, moral scholars writing so they can, um, so it brings agency to, to everyday life, right? Like walking, right? And lastly, by broadening the horizon of what we copyright. So there's the other idea that Chris, uh, my, myself and Chris have been talking about. We literally just want to fuck with the system at one point, right? So how about we copyright every goddamn single thing that we do, like every day, like you copyright your brushing your teeth, which means like you record yourself saying this is act one, pi Z, and then you can copyright brushing your teeth, right? And then you clog the system with ridiculous amount of copyrights, right? That's a, that's another way of kind of like use this approach to, um, to again, to, um, against its own intent. Like, for example, if you cannot have a permit on that street, right? There's a lot of interesting questions, you know? Yeah, um, for example, at the moment, if I want to close a particular street here in Oakland, I would have to go to the city and get a special permit, which costs a lot of money, and then I have to deal with the police, and then I have to have uh, X amount of um, uh, porta parties and uh, guard um, and all kinds of security, all kinds of stuff, in order to close a very small street to actually, and I did that recently, to have a block party, a fundraiser for parts. I had to go through all of this. So, again, let's think imaginatively, what if I used the Derif app and what we just did and said, well, excuse me, but we already have a copyright on that street, right? We already have copywritten that street to be part of the performing for arts commons and the Derif and the walking and see people here and show them the images. This is a copywritten corner and we have written cop uh, copyrights, you know, on the corner. How does that work, you know? Would that work, of course, not to get arrested? We get that. But what kind of rights do we have and what kind of shenanigans and transgressions can we continue having so we can occupy public space and intellectual space through using this uh, vile machine of, of, because copyright is also about competition, right? It's not even about, like, you know, if we co-create and collaborate, then we don't need to, to maintain this autonomous, like selfish, like it's mine, my mine, mine, right? The dynamics will always be there, but can we break away from them? So I'm going to turn it to you guys because I spoke too much, too many questions, but anyway, thank you. Well, first of all, thanks uh, a lot, uh, both uh, of you for um, uh, yeah, all these insights. Uh, it's good to hear, Natalia, the experiences you had the uh, last Tuesday with uh, the walk that you did. Um, also, actually, I, I, for me, it's very good to hear that some people were reluctant to install the app um, um, because, uh, uh, and the app does collect information eh? because, of course, it knows where you are, right? So, it, you know, uh, we don't sell this information. No? We don't uh, give it to third parties at all. Uh, we don't use any tracking uh, tools uh, outside uh, of the data that we collect ourselves for uh, the purpose for our own purposes and that information is available to the persons who are using the app if they choose to log in uh, online they can see all the information that's collected but um, why i'm happy to hear that some people were reluctant uh, to download the app is because then apparently the shift over the last few years uh, towards people being more aware um, of 
what information is collected about them using the tools that they have at their disposal that often are free, but are not really free because they're paying for it with their own data. The shift towards this awareness is real and uh, happening and tangible uh, according to uh, the, uh, what you are yourself are describing. So that's really good to hear. Um, Chris, super thanks also for the explanations. Um, well, first uh, on uh, a creative commons licensing, but then also adding to that uh, specifically the morals clauses that you uh, brought in. Um, uh, but uh, if I may, I do have, uh, well, two questions about this, because I think, well, there's, but first of all, there's a bunch of things that uh, are intersecting in this discussion, in this presentation, and some I think are easier to understand and to uh, um, uh, to discuss and to, to, to put into practice, and some are a bit more complex. Uh, for example, I think the, the morals clause, as you explained it, is, is very easy to understand, and it's also very easy to implement. Um, one, one very simple example that immediately came to my mind is uh, the color Vanta Black. Uh, you must know the story because it, it's, it uses a morals clause to define that only, uh, what is his name, Anish Kapoor can use Vanta Black. He's the only person yes. that can use Vanta Black because the morals clause prescribes that this color is his, right, to use artistically, I think it is specifically. He's the only artist that can use this color. Um, and to counter this, there's this other guy who then made a very pink uh, pigment, which has a morals clause that Anish Kapoor cannot use this particular shade of pink. Yeah, so uh, this is very easy to understand. A morals clause restricts uh, usage on whatever, for whatever reason, or allows usage for whatever reason, uh, decided by the creator. This is very easy to understand. Um, so this part, uh, I think we should all deploy all the time. We can set restrictions on the work that we create, right? Or, or the or or the opposite of restrictions, uh, allowances. Um, but I f I find it much harder to understand how you could use this specifically in the public space, because whatever you claim as an individual in the public space. Uh, is subject to the rules and regulations that apply in the public space. And these are not the same everywhere, right? Uh, the most typical, the most practical example, perhaps, is that you can't just film people in public in Germany, which is exactly the reason why there's almost no uh, Google Street View in Germany, because Google is not allowed to just film everyone, right? To film what to do, even if they block out people's faces. German law pre prevents this from being done, or at least within the way that Google wants to do it. Um, but generally speaking, for you can film in public. What you record in public uh, is yours to record, even if there are copyrighted uh, symbols visible in public. It doesn't matter because the allowance is for this recording that someone is making, uh, to be made. You can make this recording because it's in public. Whatever you claim as an individual, if you hold up a copyrighted sign or something over which you claim copyright, that it's all very nice and well, but it doesn't matter because you can be filmed in public. So how, how do you see that in those contexts then work? You can, before I let you respond, you can also, of course, claim that, although I think that's difficult to make the argument, but you can claim that activism is a kind of still subject to the laws that apply for um, uh, the public space. So how do you see that? Yeah, yeah, those are really great, really great points and, and, and really great questions that do um, create uh, a, a lot of, of, well, they can quickly create crisis in, inside the system. So. Um, for instance, in, in the U.S., you're right, you can, uh, and, and in many other countries, but I'll, I'll speak again to the, to the U.S. context just because I know the law there a little more, a little more cleanly, but I know in each of these, um, it will vary by, by jurisdiction, but yes, you can film anyone in public, um, but you are not allowed to actually film a copyrighted performance, um, for anything other than personal use. So there are, um, fair use uh, exceptions to all copyright law, which always allow for some type of personal use. 
where things start to get really challenging is when um, let's let's take private surveillance. I, I think I think we can even tie this into some of the the meta concerns that have um, uh, that are arising. You know, both in terms of data mining from from people wanting to do walks and, and downloading an app to others walking the streets of Oakland and and not wanting Palantir cameras. I, I think I think around Pro Arts it was counted that there were maybe 18 different surveillance cameras pointed on to Oscar 56, Grant. 56, 56. 56. Just amazing. 56, 56 surveillance cameras pointed onto a, a public square. Um, what are what are they what what is being filmed and for what purpose and is there is there any commercial use behind what is being filmed and if there is commercial use are they filming something that is copyrighted um those all the the facts become crucial in de in determining whether something is lawful or not but as an example of of what is not allowed for instance um in terms of the the ability to, to sort of otherwise film freely in, in a public space, you, you can't take a copy written book um, and bring it out into a public square and just turn the pages through it and have someone film it and then sell the book and say that because this book was in the public space as it was being opened that it's somehow permissible to be copied and then sold. Um, you know, that, that's probably an obvious example of how you would see someone trying to use these public space rules as a means to flout, um, to flout the copyright protection. Um, nor can, so, so what gets really interesting here and what I, what I think is exciting about the, the Derive app is that in order to get copyright protection of a live performance, um, you typically have to be performing something that is already scripted or that is already published as a copyrighted work itself. Uh, so what, what it takes to have something scripted is again, a, a really loose standard. There's no, there's no clear cut guideline, but in terms of layering, when, when I think of prompts um, that one may do as, as the, the kind of pioneers on, on a first walk following prompts, are going to be following what then becomes perhaps a script for another walk, right? So, so I, I could, um, following the walk that was done in Oakland a couple of days ago, I, I downloaded the, the, the stack of prompts. And although I, I, I think maybe I was having a, a technical issue or maybe the technical issue is still getting resolved on what had happened on the walk, but if I'm able to know where one had walked, you know, and, and uh, if there's geofencing around a, a place where all of a sudden a sound is unlocked as you get to a new space. When one goes and does the same walk, arguably one is performing the script for the walk. And that script and that walk could, could arguably be a copyrighted performance of a, a kind of play in public space. Now that doesn't mean that people still can't film, take a picture of you as you're doing the walk and, and then somehow they're in trouble. Um, but again, because that's going to fall within the fair use gamut and there's gonna be a question of, well, what are they filming you for, for this thing? If it's a private surveillance camera that's just sitting there and it's constantly filming for some perhaps commercial use, again, it could be something where they're going to be selling that data for advertising purposes or mining that data for some purpose that will be commercial, um, we get right to a point of utter um, confusion in, term, in the law right now between data ownership, right? Is, is the data um, owned, if we're to sort of mine metadata of, of people walking as Google does all the time, right? So we have our, our uh, I have a Google phone. Of course, it's tracking me everywhere I go. It's gonna mine my metadata, try to anonymize it or something, but it's taking all of that data that it then says is its own proprietary data. But 
but it can't take proprietary data. Or, well, it, it's a point of confusion as to whether one can mine data and make that data proprietary if what it's mining is actually a copyrighted performance in the first place. Um, an example of this is, um, well, here, here's an example that, that comes up in, in, the, in the context of protest. So, um, gosh, I already, I'm forgetting how many years ago it was where Standing Rock uh, in the Dakotas was a really strong protest at the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, Dakota Access Pipeline, this is a private, private oil company owned by Energy Transfer Partners. They're bringing, oil, trying to build an oil pipeline across Lakota land. Protesters descend and say, no, you're not going to bring the pipeline across our land. So far, it's an entirely private affair for the most part. Energy Transfer Partners hires um, Tiger, Tiger Swan, I think is what they're called, uh, a group of former you know, black ops mercenaries trained by the US military doing surveillance in Iraq who've now become uh, uh, four higher mercenaries who through a private contract with energy transfer partners are flying a helicopter around and they're filming the protests and then they're selling that data, you know, it's a multi-million dollar contract to state in order to try and uh, pursue some type of uh, uh, prosecute protesters as activists for you know whatever they could come up with, get whatever they could stick. We get it. We can um, at the moment, you know, at that time, the the protest itself was not sort of scripted or constructed in a way to have been sort of rendered a performance of a of a copyrighted script such that the whole activist protest was a copyrighted performance, although arguably, you know, that, that just becomes sort of a point of semantics. Um, had it been sort of scripted and really done perhaps as a legal strategy to make this a copyrighted performance, then, and, and say everyone um, at the protest had a, a copyright license on and said, this is a performance, I am performing, you know, uh, and this is a copyrighted performance, all of a sudden, there's a very big problem for Tiger Swan to be filming them. It, the, the, the case would become probably more obvious if you thought, imagine Beyonce showed up at the protest and performed a, a hit song. We know, you know, just from YouTube um, taking, you know, doing, doing video takedowns of home, home videos just because an ABBA song is playing in the background. That, yeah. that app, right? In that but, moment, I understand uh, your point there, right? Uh, that's, I think, a slightly different situation. I also, very early on in your talk, I was reminded of, um, um, I, f I forget the details, but there is this one American policeman who uh, constantly plays, I think it's Mariah Carey in the background as his body cam is on. So yes. that his uh, videos cannot be shared on YouTube because they get taken down because it's a copyright infringement, right? Yes. This, this I understand. Um, but uh, this works because, uh, uh, you know, Google doesn't care really about uh, the legalities. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, they hear uh, music that's playing that is copyrighted by someone, and then they take down the video. But the video is available in the public sphere, like on YouTube. Whereas um, if uh, Black Swan, Tiger Swan, uh, films um, Beyonce, who might be performing one of her songs, um, and then sells that to uh, um, uh, to uh, the pipeline company. Uh, you know, no Google is ever going to see this, right? Because it stays in within closed doors. So these automated uh, processes do not kick in. Um, and Beyonce, in fact, will never know that these things are being sold, right? Um, but even then, um, yeah. I, I understand your maybe I can maybe I can say something because um maybe maybe those um maybe we should bring it back to performing cross grammar. So what happened very, very uh really to us and I kinda like um spoke to Chris and we still want the I still wanna do a lawsuit by the way, just so you know, Chris. Um what happened is that during the riots here in July after um 
you know, uh, the call, the call, Oakland was kind of on fire. Uh, a lot of um, artists took the streets um, via, um, because they boarded the whole city, all the whatever capitalist establishments, windows were broken, all the businesses started to board their, city, uh, board their windows with uh, plywood, right? And so what happened is that all the artists got on the streets and they started painting those plywoods and started making artworks, of course, in a protest mode. And it was incredible because there's a lot of, like the whole city all of a sudden looked like Berlin. <laughs> it was like graffiti and like murals everywhere on these plywoods, right? Two things about that. It's interesting because that did happen. Uh, and now there's kind of like still a process, I believe. Who, um, because those boards were then taken down because they were temporary solution for the business owners, right? The artists went, painted those uh, street boards, and um, and then uh, the business owners uh, threw them out, let's say, or disposed of them, or um, you know, pictures were taken, millions of pictures were taken. Who, um, but no, but there, if there's no tagging, nobody knew who is the artist, right? So artists became super aware of this thing called copyright. To us though, so and again, um, actually a lot of them went through the Varga copyright for visual artists uh, process. Some of them didn't even bother, but it was it's cruciating that they that they saw their work basically um, being thrown in the garbage, you know, or in the worst case scenario, being being taken by Oakland Museum, and that's what they're worried about. They're being taken by Oakland Museum and then sold without even their knowledge. These big protest boards, right? And then, of course, you know, they would not see anything. You know, they wouldn't see money, they wouldn't see visibility because nobody would know that they did that. So what happened with us is that we had already done this performing product commons copyright license, right? And so, um, so we were performing product commons as we ourselves tagged. We didn't have artists, we just ourselves in a way like products, which is also, of course, a lot of artists, Tagged our, um, tagged our, um, uh, I guess, boards, okay, plywood boards. Now, in our case, the city puts these plywood boards, right? And not only the city, but there's a service that the city uses to come and put these plywood boards and then to, um, uh, to take them down and all these kind of things. And they pay for it and that's what's up, right? Every time there's a protest, they're like, okay, products, we're going to come and put your ply, and even if you don't want them, they, they, they come. So we decided that we're going to transgress and instead of beautiful murals and gorgeous kind of like embodiment of, of unfortunate, um, like more than unfortunate, like craziness here and death and horrific situation, we would actually t test the limits of what the aesthetics of, of the revolution in a way, right? So we actually wrote all of our graffitis were um, kind of like um, kill the pigs, um, the Pigs can get it up. I mean, like all kinds of pervasive, perverse, perverse, and sort of like super explicit um, kind of like language. Now, what further happened is that that language became sanctioned, right? So everywhere, you, like if it was beautiful mural and even beautiful graffiti, no problema. The city left this as an artwork. It got commissioned for more stuff. But if you had kill the pigs or the pigs sticks, right? You, that became a sanctioned language. So we did that san sanctioned language. We actually m made our boards extremely ugly, sort of like super, like, uh, just, um, uh, just uh, like, like if you're in a bathroom in the eighties, is in a small club, right? <laughs> and so to this, to this extent, um, it was very interesting because, of course, the next day I go to France to open the space, and of course, what happens? But, you know, the city has sent these people to erase our board because we have killed the pigs and all this shit, right? And it's not, it's sanctioned by the city. So this third company, you know, they're hired by the city. They, um, of course, came, erased the boards, and we said, oh, wait a second now. We recorded us performing Prod's Commons, writing the sanctioned language as a performance. We had a script. We put copyright signs all over those boards. And now you have transgressor copyright. And now we can go and sue you. Not the city, the company that erased the boards. 
because we also filmed by 56 cameras doing that. So, Chris, do you want to talk a little bit further about that? Yeah, well, yeah, I think, um, I mean, in, in each of those cases, so the, I mean, um, to the to the instance of YouTube and energy transfer partners, it, it the, there there's a problem in in one instance of detection of knowing when someone has infringed copyright, um, and that again goes to how that copyright ultimately is used. But it's not a defend the the the, the legal issue has still arisen, so. In both of these instances, um, what can be really powerful when you have something that isn't about a platform that has, you know, like YouTube, which of course is going to get the easy algorithm for takedown, and YouTube and these service providers also have created their own laws as a state to have safe harbors so that they also only get you, they get to eat their cake, have their cake and eat it too. They can profit off of people uploading videos, but they don't have to take on any of the liability yeah, yeah. if someone uploads something with a copyright infringement. When we go to the other side, though, and we have these challenges where a company has infringed, broken the law in terms of violated copyright, but we might not know or we can't really get at what's happening there, um, it's true that in many instances, that's going to just kind of go by the wayside much in the same way as it would if you can manage to get copyrighted content up on Google and the algorithm doesn't, or on YouTube and, and, the, and the algorithm doesn't catch it. But what's really powerful here, if that information is used to, um, to then be sort of used against someone, because at, at some point, if, it, if, it's, if it's going to be used against, it, it's in some activist sense, it's probably going to be used against a protester. It's going to become evidence of some other crime that they're going to try and show the protesters guilty of, right? It may be that the protester was assaulting a, a canine officer, you know, whatever they're going to say. Um, or it may be that, um, that they'll say with the, with the pro arts boards that, um, maybe some other crime took place, you know, who knows what, what they're going to maybe use at some point, but they're going to try and take that footage or they're going to try and take the evidence that they've now taken down as a copyright infringement in order to bring some other charge. What, what, has, what needs to happen then, and, and this is what public defenders have actually been getting excited about some of these strategies, is it opens up a whole new legal defense that otherwise was not available and that it then becomes incumbent upon the public defenders to begin asking for discovery, say, where did this evidence come from? How did you get it? And then what this does is it actually also further opens up court mandated discovery, at least inside the US where discovery is very broad. You know, once you're in a litigation or there's some criminal proceeding in the US, you can get into discovery, you get everything if you're a lawyer for the most part, especially if it has to do with some commercial enterprise if you're going to argue copyright infringement or something like this along the way. So contracts that have otherwise been near impossible to get, a contract between, say, the South Dakota Police Department and Energy Transfer Partners or, or Tiger Swan, or perhaps a contract between this third party that's taking the boards down in Oakland and the Oakland City Council. Um, these contracts are very opaque as well, very difficult for the public to get their hands on. And even when you do what's called a FOIA request, the Freedom of Information Act request in the US, you may try and get one, but the, the people who are redacting and trying to censor information out from delivering it to the public, even though it's publicly owned information, are not accountable. You don't really have, you, you can do the same FOIA request twice and once might be all black and redacted to them the next time through it actually went out. That, that um, when you go through a FOIA request to the state, it becomes difficult to get the information. But if you have copyright infringement that all of a sudden has come into play and you're in some type of proceeding with the state and you want to get access to the contract, you then can, you have a whole new legal argument for why you should get it. And at that point, the contract can also become publicly known, which creates all other types of leverage to say, why are we, you know, 
there's contracts right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, th these contracts will be into the into the tens of millions of dollars. Why are we spending fifteen million dollars of taxpayer money to have some third party just come and do something that they didn't need to do in the first place? But now they're saying is necessary. This happens in prisons all the time. Um, there's there are private companies now that scan all of the mail that goes into a federal prison. The scanning is justified by saying, well, we have to do surveillance to make sure that there isn't, you know, some plot to have people escape. That's fine. It used to be the law used to be that the guards could read the mail that went in. But reading the mail is, as, as a state employee is very different than having a third party make a digital copy and upload that into a database. That is that is sort of per se illegal. But it's only by trying to bring and sort of occupy the copyright inside of this that we can actually begin to bust up these types of practices that are um, that are really sort of the enabling practices of much of kind of the the, the public private partnership for state level surveillance and sort of incarceration. Uh, the simplicity of your uh, example here, uh, although I'm not, uh, I'm still not totally convinced that uh, it's a workable example, but it's a clear uh, example of copyright infringement in uh, uh, the context of public security, right? Uh, that is, uh, mail that is sent to federal prisoners is being scanned to identify uh, contraband or to identify a problematic content. But this is by design a literal copyright infringement. Uh, so that's that, that's that's an interesting case. Although I'm not yet convinced that it's you know, relevant uh, uh, until it happens maybe to uh, um, um, what's a big artist? Uh, yeah, David Bowie's dead, right? So I don't know. Some some big if some big artist happens to end up uh, sending mail to uh, prisoners. Uh, and that then is scanned, uh, well, yeah, maybe, but even then. Um, but I, I'm, I, okay, I understand the case. Uh, so that's that's that. I, yeah. I'm sorry to say, but we've been going for two hours and maybe yeah. we should uh, start wrapping it up. Uh, um, I have um, uh, three uh, s more entertaining questions maybe, uh, I suppose for Chris. You mentioned very early on that not all countries have copyright laws. Which countries yeah. do not have copyright laws? I need to check the latest. It's typically rise out of the Berne Convention has the largest number of signatories, but I think, um, oh. Uh, if you can't name one, that's also okay. There you now. Yeah. Um, it's it's countries that typically uh, uh, countries where there's authoritarian regime. Um, I'm not aware of of any non-authoritarian. Uh, yeah. Anyways, there, there, there's a list, um, a, a very short list of of countries that that no longer have them. Um, there's also um, this one story that that also. I was reminded of uh, during uh, your talk uh, is that there's this there was this guy Russian um, and he changed um, the text that was sent to him by a credit card company uh, uh, and I forget the exact details but he ended up getting free credit because he I think it was because he changed the wording in the contract that was sent to him uh, and signed it changed the wording signed it sent it back to the bank the bank signed it in return and then he had free credit um, because the bank didn't check the wording that he changed, right? Um, uh, so I was reminded of this as well, where you were using the tools of the oppressor against yes. uh, the oppressor itself. Um, although this was not, well, you know, technically I suppose you could argue it's a copyright infringement, but uh, it was a contract and he just changed the contract before the bank signed it. So before the bank counter signed it. So I was reminded of that. Um, then there's also, um, I, yeah, I'm not a copyright lawyer, right? But I remember these stories. Um, and there's a few that, of a few films that accidentally fell out of copyright because they were not um, um, uh, marked uh, properly as such. But I'm also I also understand that this no longer can happen because automatically the copyright is assumed or something. But at the time, this is like the 70s or something. This was not the case. So there's a few major films at, from that time who 
accidentally fell out of copyright immediately. Um, but that no longer can happen. And then uh, one last thing is, I was very, also very early on in your talk reminded of NFTs, NFTs. Although it's a completely different uh, type of thing, of course, but it's also, uh, well, that definitely is sold as um, uh, something that is supposed to benefit artists. Um, but I'm very skeptical of, um, of those. But do you see a kind of link between NFTs and uh, um, uh, and the uh, com commons clauses or more clauses in the in the commons? Yeah, um, yeah. Let me let me try and address each of those quickly. And I did just check. Um, Turkmenistan and San Marino have no copyright laws. San Marino, but well, that's the oldest yeah. republic in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, really. Yes. Yeah. It was yeah. a republic in like 312 uh, AD. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think there's a few. People, right? right, right. Um, let's see. Um, on <laughs> yeah, yeah. On um, on the on the changing of language. Yeah, that ends up being a battle of adhesion contracts oftentimes, um, but it's smart. Any Anytime you can, change the words, initial it, and then send it back. And if they accept, it's good, it's good contract law. Um, there's another thing that happened in the US that prompted a litigation that is actually really important. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned works that had been in the public domain and then got pulled back into, into copyright protection um, and that th these sort of works got resurrected back into copyright protection because copyright term had changed and they had changed certain dates. But you're right that that has since since passed. Um, there does remain a very big problem of what are called orphan works, which are works that are now under copyright. You know they've been pulled back on the public domain into copyright, but they can't find the author. Yep. So what do you do? Actually, uh, quite a lot of video games uh, from like the 80s uh, that uh, are in that situation. Yeah. And a, a very important policy question that arises around intellectual property when these have come up in the U.S. is that copy of intellectual property is is enabled only through what's called the Progress Clause in the Constitution, Article One, Section Eight, Clause Eight, which says Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by granting to authors and inventors for a limited time, and then it sort of goes on. But this progress of science means progress of science in, in its 18th century context was knowledge production and useful arts was actually referring to industrial, the patentable subject matter, industrial art. But this idea of progress and that word in particular, what does it mean? Intellectual property laws are supposed to enable a growth of knowledge production but how is that the case when we're pulling works from the public domain back into copyright protection, things like this? These are questions that's only been litigated once, um, early 2000s, Lawrence Lessig, a Harvard law professor and oh, yeah. involved in the founding of Creative Commons, tried to litigate this, this word progress. Um, a lot of intellectual property lawyers these days are getting excited about trying to litigate that word progress again, so as to chip away at this maximalist IP tendency and that will have international effects as well, just given the, the role of, US, um, of the U.S. on international IP policy. Um, and then lastly, when it comes to NFTs and, and, and morals clauses and the like, you know, I don't have a, a too much of, like, I don't have a particularly well-formed kind of intelligent idea on it, but there is something, I think, to, to, to having morals clauses and, and sort of a layer of artwork that exists that's invisible to the typical visual representation or, or sort of set the, the material art that we're actually enjoying when we look here smell you know that's sensual um can be utterly disconnected from the art that we want to make when if we're going to make art inside the ip license you know, inside the economic terms upon which the art is interfacing with the economy to where, like you said, you know, I mean, using the example of a, a color, a, a particular color of black or a particular color of pink has nothing to do with who can or can't use it. 
but the art exists in terms of those restrictions around access there more generally. If we do something, you know, if, if we have a, a picture of a dog and then the, or, you know, whatever it may be, and then the conditions are like, you can't look at, you know, maybe it's veiled behind, so you go into a gallery, you're not allowed to lift this up and look at this picture of a dog unless you pet a cat or something. You know, it can be completely arbitrary and different, but room for there to also bring in the absurdity of the conditions that maybe that we may want to bring in terms of our engagement in 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 our senses with the art and the embodiment of art. And I think in terms of thinking about the the kind of meta layers of art and expression that go into um, the privatization and sort of the the rivalry, the sort of exclusivity of some of these artworks that otherwise can be easily replicated due to new technologies. There's something interesting there that I, I from the NFT side, you know, I mean, just in terms of having kind of tokens that, um, you know, I mean, it, to me, it, it's they're sort of absurd in that you can, you we're creating um, rivalry, you know, we're, we're sort of creating a unique package and something that is otherwise just again a kind of uh, surrounded by zeros and ones you know it, it's something that's that's artificial scarcity and i think getting into artificial scarcity and, and sort of the human experience with artificial scarcity at a moment where real scarcity is oftentimes overlooked um, inside the art market and, and in those veins i think i think there's interesting things to explore there but i don't i don't i probably don't have much else um, of note to kind of dive into on that front. Uh, of course, a slightly different uh, subject matter as well. Um, and indeed, it's I want to say something still, about yeah. NFTs is that I actually have been, um, uh, so I, I became very uh, happy with the NFTs because um, when, the, when whatever, the NFTs, I thought that we can connect the NFTs to already the moral squad statement. So basically having, um, you know, tiny, having an art, artist signature and that kind of like creates this, you know, this, this royalty base, but on a different terms, like within the commons idea, right? But equal kind of giving. But the NFTs will never be good because it's only for the Jay-Zs of the world, right? You know what I mean? Only like people in Oakland have been dropping NFTs every day since the big hype and nobody knows about them. Nobody will ever know about them because there's another saturation of a market immediately, especially with digital art, right? Nobody knows Mike Z who just dropped an NFT right here, you know? So I, but I want to tell something exciting because I was so excited about this possibility of, um, of using this digital coin to actually empower, like, let's say a homeless DJ, right? You know what I mean? Like, let's, let's, let's do something that it's a little bit more empowering to those who would never get it. Um, we started talking actually about artists, uh, about, you know, social currency or, or something that is developed by the artists for the artists here in Oakland. And, um, I will in the next several months, uh, finally, you know, coerce. <laughs> it's been difficult during the pandemic. But um, a lot of people, a lot of artists, and a lot of kind of like, uh, in general, like uh, people who are interested in NFTs and the digital side of things um, are very excited to create their own currency. Because I think the NFT has shown them that like, wait, why do we have to use NFTs? Why don't we get together in a room and create our own artist currency? And we can have artists for artists and we can take care of ourselves, not the Jay-Z's, right? Because we can be really famous in Oakland. Guess what? With an artist coin, right? So we talked about this artist coin and me and Chris actually had some like interesting conversation about how we can actually transgress this idea of the artist coin further by like saying all the artist coins are one dollar or like one cent, like just even devalue it to an extent where it becomes like, so we question this mode. Like we always question this mode, like, because the hype of NFTs has shown us that anything can become like, you know, hot for about a second, but like the, the craze, like the craze here was real. Every gallery that I spoke to immediately turned all their programs to like NFTs. I'm like, why? Mm. You don't even know what it works. <laughs> like how, who, who do you make rich right now? You know, anyway, so I, yeah. I just thought it's interesting because it brought us to a different conversation here. It's like, wait, fuck the NFTs. Let's do our own currency. You know. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. I understand the the um, ideological interest that comes uh, with both NFTs and uh, 
crypto coins, although we're now shifting into a completely different discussion, but I understand the ideological uh, appeal, um, but the, 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 the practical downsides or the practical challenges are immense. Uh, the cost of uh, creating NFTs are huge and they don't really solve a problem uh, because you don't need NFTs to sell anything, right? Yeah. So so that's about NFTs. And then about uh, crypto, um, um, it's, it also does not solve a problem that is real um, because you don't, you, you, you can use your own currency, but you can also use uh, tea leaves, right? Or you can use a North Korean won or whatever it is that they have in North Korea. It, um, it, it doesn't change anything um, by using a, a third party uh, or your own currency because you still have to believe in the value of uh, whatever it is that you're trading. Uh, and uh, if it's a real currency, then you don't have the control over it that you believe you would, just like you don't have control over dollars. You don't have control over something that is actually worth something if other people also start accepting it, because they can also then manipulate the value, because that would be the point of the of it being a currency. Anyway, we, we yeah. shifted into other territory, but it's interesting territory. And it's also interesting because it touches on, um, uh, well, uh, on, the, on the role of what, what it means to attach value to uh, the work that we create, right? Um, and in and one way in which we also do this is through uh, licensing agreements, whether it's copyright or creative commons or uh, no derivative share alike, uh, um, uh, and uh, listing who has uh, who has made the work itself. Um, I, I think it's a good moment to end this conversation. <laughs> um, it, but it was it was really nice. Um, it's uh, I I really enjoy that uh, you took the time, uh, Chris, to. Um, talk about uh, copyright models or licensing models, uh, specifically for artists. Um, and it's fascinating uh, also to see how this opens up new questions uh, within um, the creation of art. And it was really nice to hear, Natalia, how that worked in practice uh, with, uh, well, with the walk that you did on Tuesday. But I think well, more yeah. interestingly, how you tried to tackle this with uh, the, the boards that were shutting down the shops and painting them and then stating that you or your artists own the copyright, <laughs> which is extremely true, um, which is a very practical example of, uh, Chris, uh, your um, uh, uh, Beyonce performance in, a, in along one of the oil pipelines where she owned the copyrights to the song, but in this case, it were these artists who owned the copyrights to what they uh, put on the boards. Uh, it was theirs, not uh, someone else's. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, Cheers. thank you so much.